All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Invasive Species Center's 2021 um, Ontario Invasive Species Forum. My name is Kristen Palionis, and I am a program development coordinator with the uh, Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator uh, for the session. Before we get started, uh, there are a couple of things I want to uh, mention. Um, there will be time for questions at the very end of the session. So if you have a question at any time, please type it in um, the question box in the control panel, and I will get, that, get to them at the end of uh, the presentations. Lastly, if you're having any technical difficulties at any time, please type them in the question box, and we will do our best to um, help you out. So this morning's uh, session is titled Spotted Lanternfly and Other Horticultural Pests. And I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Mandy Ennis, who will be presenting on Spotted Lanternfly. Mandy is a program development coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, where she focuses on report writing through literature review and primary research through surveys. Her work at the Invasive Species Center began all, all things spotted lanternfly, and she has seen this insect in action. She is also an adjunct professor in the biology department at Algoma University, where she instructs on a variety of topics from vertebrate evolution to plant physiology. This presentation will provide a high-level introduction to spotted lanternfly biology, North American distribution and, and impacts, potential for invasion in Ontario, and what we're doing at the Invasive Species Centre to get the word out. So thank you, Mandy, for joining us this morning, and I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Kristen. Uh, I'm just going to go to the screen share. Oh, did that work? Sorry about this, I all of a sudden can't find how I share my screen. There you go, Mandy. Okay. So, we're gonna do, oops, okay. Screen two. And, can you see this okay? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for that introduction, Kristen. Um, so as she mentioned, I am a uh, pro program coordinator, development coordinator at the Invasive Species Center. Um, and I'll be talking in a really high level talk about spotted lanternfly. So again, I'm gonna cover the biology, the distribution, the invasion potential, and then finally what you can do. So first we'll start with the biology. So spotted lanternfly don't bite or sting. They don't cause any physical harm to people overall. So we can see that uh, in that image here. So this is actually uh, a USDA member named Louise Bugby. Uh, I met her in Pennsylvania and she's showing me those open wings, uh, that those beautiful showy red wings beneath. And to make that point, those showy red wings make it look as if it is like a butterfly. It is not. This is from uh, the, the plant hopper family. And so usually when we see spotted lanternfly in images, uh, or if we see them in real life, they're kind of this uh, closed wing version here or this open wing version here. We don't usually see them in this ominous uh, visual right here like we're seeing this guy. Uh, I love this image. I think it really does show uh, a lot of spotted lanternfly and how ominous this insect actually is. So these little red bits here, there aren't the eyes, although it'd be cool if it, they were. <laughs> they aren't. They're above. These are actually little modified antenna. And so these guys are flown feeders. They come from a group called the plant hoppers and they feed on plants. And so what you can see here is this long proboscis and it's sticking into the plant and it's sucking up phloem tissue or the sugary substance uh, that is distributed throughout the plant, uh, the nutrients. So the sugars are created in the leaves and then they distribute it through the body of the plant. So this is, you know, comparable to a mosquito sticking its proboscis into your arm and drinking your blood. Now they do this by the thousands. And so we can see that in this image here. So when a spotted lantern, when there is an infestation of spotted lanternfly, it can get out of control rather quickly uh, and, uh, and swarm feed. And so because they're feeding directly on a sugary substance, they're actually uh, excreting or pooping direct pure sugar. Uh, and so 
this, you know, has this cute name of honeydew. It's a cute name for something that's actually pretty gross. Uh, and because there are so many of them, it's actually literally raining down from the canopy. And so this is an image I took when I was in Pennsylvania. This is Allentown, Pennsylvania, in a recreational area uh, on a trail. And so there were people walking past, walking their dogs, and the whole time it's dripping on us from the canopy. Uh, actually, when we left this area, my hair was sticky. It's that gross. Um, and so because it's pure sugar also, and sugar is a requirement for many, many bodies of many, many animals, it attracts all kinds of things into the area. And so what you're seeing here is um, some spotted lanternfly, and then this is an ivy that's growing up the tree, and you can see there's a dark bit accumulated and it's a bit shiny. So that's actually because they're they're dripping it down that that sugar is accumulating at the base of the tree and it's fostering sooty mold growth. And then over time, that mold gets worse and worse and it gives off this really terrible vinegary smell. Just makes, it's a, it's a gross aspect, the whole deal. Uh, and so I have a couple images uh, or videos that were shared to me um, that I wanted to share with you. So uh, Heather Leach, who is uh, on the ground management in Pennsylvania, she works out of Penn State Extension. She is uh, the spotted lanternfly expert in management for sure. And uh, she provided me with a couple of videos, only at the last minute I recognized that one of them wasn't working. And so I had to uh, you know, quickly go online and find a similar video. And so I just wanted to show you that swarm behavior, all those animals, uh, insects, sorry, feeding at the same time. So let's take a look at that. Uh, and also, uh, there's a bit of music at the beginning of this, but you're going to hear the sound of Spotted Lanternfly as well. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, so pretty gross, right? That's a lot of bugs. Uh, again, no harm comes to this guy. He's rubbing them off the tree, but there are just thousands of them uh, clicking all together, jumping all over the place. Pretty, pretty awful. And then just to show you uh, what that that um, uh, phloem is, so they're, they're that excretion of honeydew, Heather show, uh, gave me this video to provide as well, and it was working, so that's great. So pay attention to the back end. <laughs> So you can see that it is, you know, squirting those sugars away from itself so that it doesn't, uh, you know, get on its body and cause problems for the animals. So the sugars get squirted away. And you can imagine this is one individual doing this. If there are thousands in the canopy above you, you know, how often the squirting is actually happening. You can even see the proboscis right here going into the tree. So it's just, you know, eating and pooping and eating and pooping. I mean, that's what's going on. <laughs> Now, something about spotted lanternfly that uh, is interesting uh, as a plant hopper is usually plant hoppers tend to be really host specific. Well, that's not the case with spotted lanternfly. Uh, they actually feed on uh, more than 70 types of plants, uh, including um, grapes. And you can't mention spotted lanternfly without mentioning the viticulture industry. It is the hardest hit by spotted lanternfly. Uh, and we will talk about that uh, and what's going on in the area where the densities are highest in the United States. It also is an orchard pest, um, although there isn't evidence yet that it kills orchard trees, but it certainly can swarm in those locations and feed uh, you know, by the thousands as we see. Additionally, it will feed on uh, urban trees, um, so, so trees that are lining urban streets like black walnut, maple, sycamore, sumac, um, and, and that's what we are seeing. Well, it was a tree of heaven that we saw in Allentown, Pennsylvania, but right next door was black walnut and it had been affected as well. Uh, also, hops, vegetables, all kinds of crops, uh, you know, that, that are out there are affected by spotted lanternfly. They are really not host specific. And you can't mention spotted lanternfly uh, without mentioning grapes, but also tree of heaven. Uh, that is a really, really important host of spotted lanternfly. It was originally thought that it might play a really important role in their um, life cycle overall. So they need to feed on spotted or, or tree of heaven in order to complete their life cycle. They're finding now that's not the case but it's still a very important host. It's also an invasive uh, and it comes from Asia where spotted lanternfly uh, uh, come from as well. And so they found their hosts right here, ready to go once they arrived. So let's talk their life cycle. We're gonna start with the eggs. So the eggs are a real big vector problem. So this is generally how spotted lanternfly are moving around. So they're really difficult to spot and laid on almost anything, rocks, trees, barbecues. Um, 
tree trunks. Uh, Heather Leach, I saw a, a talk that she did where it was on a woman's, there was an egg mass on a woman's straw hat. Just if it's outside, they might get uh, eggs laid on it as a result. So these guys are, uh, they also don't lay eggs on their hosts, which is generally a plant hopper thing. Now they're really, really hard to spot. So she'll, this is an adult, she'll come out, she'll lay their eggs between September and December, then she covers them up with this putty-like material that cracks over time, uh, but the eggs remain viable and they overwinter. Now then there are uh, four instars of spotted lanternflies, so these nymph stages, just different stages as the animal is growing or the insect is growing. Uh, and these are difficult to spot, not impossible, but at the first instar in May and June, they're about tick sized versus, uh, you know, by the fourth instar, they're about half an inch, much more showy. They have some red on them. Quite, quite beautiful insects, actually. Uh, something that's interesting about these is that not only do spotted lanternflies feed on 70 types of hosts, but the nymphs or the instars have different host preferences than the adults. And so that makes them even more difficult to detect because their preferences will also change throughout an individual's life. Uh, so these little guys, uh, you know, they will also feed by the thousands and they're capable of killing seedlings and limbs and full-size trees. They're incapable of flight, but they have really, really sticky feet and they are also a vector as a result of this, right? So they might get on your clothes if you're walking in an area and then you get into your car and travel somewhere else, bring it along. We end with the adults, really easy to spot, big insect, about an inch long, uh, really, really showy. These guys are climbers, really strong hoppers. They also can fly. Um, but plant hoppers, they have really, really, really strong back legs and are capable of launching themselves uh, a good distance. Uh, on these, there's a difficulty with the hosts because uh, the host species tends to be less important than individual hosts, meaning, uh, you know, there'll be a, tr a, a street lined with a bunch of maple trees and only one of them will be hit really, really hard with spotted lanternfly. So now we know about their biology, let's talk their current distribution in North America. So this is a great gift put together by um, our graphics department. And so spotted lanternfly originally arrived in North America in 2014, uh, right in the center of this orange mass here. Uh, and what you're looking at with that uh, orange mass is this is a quarantine zone that ended up good at getting put in place as a result of the introduction of spotted lanternfly. So the orange, the quarantine zone, the borders around it are uh, state, um, uh, you know, to define the states and then um, that quarantine zone, the borders are managed by USDA and then the state or the county manages what's going on inside. So that's the orange blob. Uh, and then we can see all these additional yellow polygons uh, around. So these are detections, but no infestation, meaning an egg mass might've been found or some adults might've been found, but no population came as a result. So we can see that even from 2018, which is this one, now we're moving into 19, you know, despite the best efforts, it's still getting spread, the quarantine zone is bigger and detections happen elsewhere in other states and counties. Some of our closest neighbors have been dealing with spotted lanternfly. New York definitely has spotted lanternfly infestation, but uh, there's also detections really close to our borders of spotted lanternfly, no infestation, but detections nearby our borders. Uh, Michigan had a detection of two dead spotted lanternflies uh, and it prompted the state to ask freight carriers, warehouse workers, and drivers to keep a lookout for egg masses and uh, adults overall. Additionally, Quebec had some uh, uh, detections or identifications of two dead spotted lanternflies. These came in on commercial trucks from Pennsylvania. Uh, and so uh, it's really, really important to pay attention, to watch, especially if you're bringing in uh, goods from the quarantine zone. Um, and so this was a uh, article that came out in Ontario Fruit Growers, and you might uh, notice the name right here. Uh, Hannah contributed to this and she will be speaking next. So again, I mentioned that you can't talk about spotted lanternfly without talking about grapes. You just can't. Uh, it's, it's a big problem in the viticulture industry. This is a postcard uh, graphic that we put together uh, at the ISC and it just sort of illustrates that here are some detections of spotted lanternfly in Erie County, Michigan and one in Monroe County, Michigan. Uh, so again, no infestation but detections and uh, right across from a pretty important wine growing region in Canada overall, uh, certainly in the province. Uh, and so we want to make sure that, uh, you know, things don't get out of control if and when spotted lanternfly arrives. So some of the impacts to that Pennsylvania viticulture, uh, major, basically. So from 2017 to 19, you know, there were increasing vineyard detections all the time. 80% uh, of growers uh, that are managing for SLF, about 30% of them, sorry about that, 30% of them are um, managing for uh, spotted lanternfly <clears throat> detections. I don't know why that's still up. Okay, sorry. Um, and uh, as a result, so, you know, in, in some cases, 
all an entire vineyard loss. So this was the case in uh, two and a half acres of Pinot Noir planting. There was a 90% uh, in 40 acres, almost 50% in Chardonnay. Uh, more and more detections are happening all the time. And as a result, this is increasing the insecticide applications from about four a year to 14 in some cases, which can be a whopping increased cost to this industry, right? Up to 171% increase. Now that's going to be an extra cost for the industry, but think about all this extra pestic uh, insecticide applications, you know, to the ecologies and also just uh, to people drinking wine, knowing about all of this additional pesticide that's getting uh, put into the crop. And so, you know, that's a social impact, but there's also the growers themselves. They're not only dealing with the loss of money, but they're dealing with some real uh, hardships and uh, social impacts to their uh, industry overall. So Heather Leach, uh, again, all things management, she has this unpublished data where she surveyed a, a lot of growers um, of about spotted lanternfly and how they were uh, dealing with it and their outlook on the future as a result. And so 57% of those growers say that SLF is changing their outlook on the future of their farm. Uh, and 62% say they're either moderately or highly stressed out as a result of spotted lanternfly being in their industry. So it's causing, you know, not just economic costs, but social costs to these industries. Um, and now viticulture is important, but it's not the only industry that spotted lanternfly is causing a problem for. Landscape maintenance uh, is an issue as well. Uh, so this is an image here of a, of a member of the USDA actually uh, inspecting all of these goods. You can imagine how difficult and the length of time it takes to go through this, uh, looking at all the goods that are coming through as well as the vehicles that are coming through. Uh, and so there's this added cost of complying with the quarantine zone um, uh, equipment and, and to make sure that you're, you're you're, you're being compliant and not spreading spotted lanternfly outside. Uh, and uh, you know, there's all these extra costs that go along with that. And then nurseries in the quarantine zones took a big hit because nobody really wanted to purchase anything coming out of, uh, of an area hit with an invasive species that hard. So now we know what's happening in Pennsylvania um, and, and, and nearby uh, states and counties in, within those states. Let's talk about whether or not it can reach Ontario. And so the way we do that, because it's not here yet, is uh, by looking at models. And there's two models that I'm going to show you today. Uh, so there's the Young model. It came out in 2017. And it basically just uh, looks at where spotted light or where any uh, uh, organism lives, and then it compares it to uh, other locations. And this one has a, a focus on climate change and how uh, you know, responses might change as a result. Important to note on this young model that uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but spotted lanternfly is additionally uh, invasive in South Korea and Japan, so it's from Asia. Um, and uh, Asia, but China is is its um, natural range, and so it's gotten into South Korea and Japan and caused a problem there. And what they've done in this model is included a lot of the information from those. Uh, populations in South Korea and Japan. We can still see that uh, the southern tip of Ontario could be affected by spotted lanternflies, well, some of the uh, Atlantic provinces, even in this model. The wacky model, oops, sorry, came out in 2019. So um, this model is a little different uh, because they include a lot of the data from that North American population. So a lot of the information uh, that is driving this model is talking about that population that got here uh, in North America. And sometimes when there is a new introduction somewhere else, the behavior of an organism can change. Uh, and so that's what we're seeing here. And so if I show you where Pennsylvania is, it makes sense that it's sitting right in the middle of this hot zone uh, because they're using a lot of the data from that area. But uh, we've really changed the amount of space that Ontario can handle. Uh, it, we're going up into a Quebec at this time, a huge portion of the Atlantic provinces. I'm way up here in Sault Ste. Marie and uh, we are capable uh, potentially of having a spotted lantern flood population as well. So here are the two models together. Uh, the young model is outlined in red and the wacky model behind in orange. Now, uh, Tree of Heaven is an important one too. This uh, distribution here I have is from this really old uh, paper and I couldn't find a Tree of Heaven, uh, a more up-to-date Tree of Heaven distribution. Uh, and that's because we don't always know where it is as a result of, uh, you know, it's an invasive, it's not something that has a natural range here. Uh, it has been invasive since the 1700s, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not looked at as much. And so it's important to know where Tree of Heaven is because it's a preferred host of spotted lanternfly uh, and, you, and you might find it in a location where there's a lot of tree of heaven and the way to determine tree of heaven uh, there's a lot of, of trees that look like this including the black walnut uh, and the um, uh, sumac that look like this where they have a, a bunch of compound leaves so a leaf with many leaflets surrounding a, a flower in the middle 
the difference with Tree of Heaven is that they have these little glandular uh, teeth, they call them, uh, little lobes at the base of each of the leaves. That's not found in any of the natural plants. Uh, and if you crush this one, it gives off a really stinky smell, uh, and that's a, a dead giveaway. And so looking at the young model and the uh, uh, distribution of Tree of Heaven, and then now we're looking at the wacky model with that distribution of Tree of Heaven, and we can see you know, it's following quite closely. So what can you do? First, uh, it pays to invest in prevention. Uh, building awareness is one of the best ways, uh, through education and outreach, is one of the best ways uh, to mitigate the uh, spread of any invasive species upon arrival. And so it's also where you get the biggest bang from your buck. Um, so we are here before species arrival, and this is where uh, Pennsylvania is sitting. And so we have an opportunity here to really get the word out, to really understand what's going on, to look for Tree of Heaven uh, so that we can understand where spotted lanternfly is and begin monitoring now uh, so that we can, you know, work in the containment phase instead of getting into this uh, high, high costs where, you know, you're, you're, you're behind. So what can you do? Well, consider the pathways. The main one is egg masses. Uh, here we can see that putty-like egg mass that's laid down uh, by the female. Here are some eggs laid in little columns that uh, they're still viable, even though they didn't get covered up in that, um, in that putty. Uh, and then over time, you can see it's cracking. It's even more difficult to see. And again, these can be laid anywhere. And it's likely that this is how they got into uh, North America on a, sh a landscaping stone, a shipment of landscaping stone. There was some egg masses on it. Now, I mentioned that behavioral differences can happen in new locations. This is something that they're seeing in the Pennsylvania population. These egg masses can be laid in a density of about or up to 200 per location versus what's seen in South Korea at about four um, per location. So they're doing very well in North America. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a real problem. So what can you do uh, aside from tracking those egg masses? Uh, and again, I mean, there's not a lot of cross-border traffic happening lately. You know, you're probably not traveling back and forth to Pennsylvania these days. But, uh, you know, if you're ordering things in or you're an agency that brings goods in, uh, you, you might want to be extra, extra careful and make sure that you are looking and, and, and uh, searching those vehicles. So uh, we promoted a uh, Tree of Heaven campaign. Uh, identify Tree of Heaven campaign through our uh, community action project, the EDRR network, uh, and uh, the Parks blog came out. So we want to know where Tree of Heaven is because it is a preferred host of spotted lanternfly. We don't have a correct map of it, and so we want to know where it is. Uh, and so you can report Tree of Heaven through the EdMaps Ontario phone number. There's also this website. Uh, and additionally, there's an app. So if you're a naturalist and you get out in the world a lot, report all the invasive species you see, not just the Tree of Heaven, but definitely report the Tree of Heaven. Additionally, report spotted lanternfly if you see it. Uh, that's pretty clear. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency are aware of spotted lanternfly. It is a regulated pest, and they will want to know if you uh, believe you have found it. Additionally, EdMaps Ontario is going to work as well. So again, there's a phone number for that and uh, the, the website, as well as that app that you can download to report. So finally, that's uh, the high level talk of spotted lanternfly out there in the world. Um, but let's just talk about some of the things that are happening in Ontario. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with our agency and many other agencies, uh, we have created the uh, Education and Outreach Committee. So remember, education and outreach is where you get the biggest bang from your buck. Uh, we need to put in um, uh, efforts at this time instead of, you know, waiting at, until after the fact when, when Spotted Lanternfly is already here. So there are members from all of these industries, you know, a, a wide variety of different industries. And, and our committee meets, you know, about twice a year. And we just cover everything Spotted Lanternfly. So what everybody's been up to, blog posts, media releases, interviews, um, any, new, uh, any new research that comes up on the scene. We try to share it uh, and get the word out and uh, collaborate with one another to make sure everyone's aware of SLF. And uh, finally, if you are uh, someone who would like some materials about Spotted Lanternfly to pass out to uh, clients or you would just like a poster in your office, maybe you, you're in an industry that might be affected by Spotted Lanternfly or uh, you just care about invasive species and you'd like to have these up, uh, we have a poster. It's available in English and French. This was done in collaboration with the CFIA and the Invasive Species Centre. Uh, we also have a two-sided technical fact sheet, a little, provides a little bit more information, more of a, a, a more technical, a lot of information is provided on that for management. Uh, and then we also have uh, this postcard that I showed you, that info, infographic of the viticulture industry, so uh, I, can, I can provide those for you as well. Uh, those postcards are available, only in English at this time. So 
Thanks very much. Uh, again, if you need any of those publicly available materials, you can email myself or Kristen. We are the uh, we are in charge, the leaders of uh, all things spotted lanternfly at the Invasive Species Center, uh, and we'd be happy to help and share uh, anything we could uh, with you and any of the materials that we have available. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy, for that very informative uh, presentation. Um, you show, you uh, provided a lot of great insights on um, the spotted lantern fly and um, provided, you know, or, or is good hearing what we're doing um, at the Invasive Species Center. So thank you for that. Um, just sorry, I'm trying to show. my screen here um anyways um I'm just going to move along here so the final presentation during this morning's uh, session is titled tales uh, from the crop spotted lanternfly and the threat of invasive pests and I am pleased to introduce Hannah Fraser. Hannah is the entomologist horticulture uh, with the Ontario Ministry of Agricultural Food and Rural Affairs and is based out of Guelph, Ontario. Her work focuses on the management of established and invasive insect pests of concern to Ontario horticulture. This includes working in collaboration with industry, other levels of government, researchers and service providers to develop strategies for emerging pest issues, including monitoring, applied research, outreach and extension and policy development. Hannah has been actively involved with uh, response to invasive pests, including plum pox virus, emerald ash borer, swede midge, spotted wing drosophila, brown marmorated stink bug, pepper weevil and others. Hannah's presentation will focus on how invasive agricultural pests can lead to significant losses to producers and Ontario's economy through increased cost of production, reduced product uh, quality and yield, as well as a potential loss of markets. Spotted lanternfly has recently made headlines in the northeastern United States and is hitchhiking its way towards the Canadian border. Can lessons learned from past encounters help inform our preparedness in response to this latest threat facing horticulture in Ontario? I'm very much looking forward to the answer to this question, Hannah, and your presentation, um, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So you can hear me, and can you see my screen? All right, and you don't see yourself in it, or do you? No? I okay. will. Okay, great. Uh, my apologies. This is a new program for me. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm really pleased to be here today. And I wanted to thank Mandy for doing such an amazing job with the Spotted Lanternfly 101. That's fantastic. Love it. Okay, so basically, I'm going to be following up the Mandy's presentation by providing some examples of situations involving invasive pests in Ontario horticulture. And my hope here is that I'm offering up some perspectives of the challenges that we faced and how we've approached finding a path forward. And I don't know, uh, I'm hoping that some of the people on this um, forum today also saw the presentation by my colleague, Denise Beaton, who talked about some of our um, current strategies um, and efforts related to invasive pests. So, um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow up and, um, and circle back to spotted lanternfly and maybe we can talk about some ways we need to prepare for this pest. So just as a reminder, I mean, insect pests have costs associated with crop production, including yield losses, then quality issues, contamination harvest, they can vector diseases, and there's of course costs associated with management, including labor and pesticides and others. But when you look at invasives, you see that there's some additional burdens. Oftentimes when these pests arrive here, they're a surprise and we don't necessarily have any products that are available to manage them. And while insecticides are not the only tool for managing insect pests, they're incredibly important, especially when you're trying to lead a response, an emergency response. There's also impacts to existing integrated pest management programs, very, very disruptive. You can have plant quarantine issues, losses of market, economic losses, environmental impacts, social impacts, and Mandy, of course, touched on a bunch of those as well. 
So to give you some perspective, agriculture is an important driver of the Ontario economy, especially when you look at horticulture. Just the farm cash receipts alone are worth over $4 billion. So that's not none of the add-ons, that's just at the farm values. So that's quite a lot of money. So our, our, we, we have a great diversity of horticultural crops. There's over 200 produced in the province. They're high value, relatively small acreage. And many of them are in concentrated growing areas. They can be located near urban centers. They can be located along major transportation corridors and they border US states. So you can see there's a real high risk for introduction and establishment. And this is one of the reasons we're worried about lantern fly. So the first that's pest that I wanted to just kind of go over is a spotted wing drosophila. Now, this is a pest uh, that is native to Asia, and it was first identified as a new pest of fruit in 2008 when it was found infesting berry crops in California. We really didn't hear much about this pest until the following year when reports started coming in from Florida, states along the Pacific Northwest, and the province of BC. The thing is with this pest is by the time it was actually detected and people knew what it actually was, it had really established itself and due to the biology, it's pretty much, well, it's very difficult to regulate and it's impossible to eradicate this pest once it's established. It resembles those common Drosophila flies that you normally find hanging around over ripe fruit on your counter or your compost bin. They're small, two to three millimeters in size. The males are easily recognized by a single dark spot on each wing that's really obvious under magnification. One of the interesting things about this pest is it attacks fruit just as it's beginning to ripen. So it carves out a niche that it doesn't have to share with related species that go after decomposing fruit. The reason it's able to do this is because the female has this heavily serrated ovipositor that she uses to actually drill through intact skin of the fruit and lay her eggs underneath. And herein lies the challenge with this pest because fruit becomes susceptible to injury in the days leading up to harvest. The female lays her eggs under the skin of the fruit and the eggs are protected from insecticides. If you look at the picture, sort of the top uh, right, you can see a little puncture hole in the skin of the fruit and those little, those are little breathing tubes that are found on the egg and they're sticking out but you don't see those for long. The larva develops in the fruit where it can remain undetected and although there are subtle signs of fruit in that a fruit is infested, you have to know what you're looking for and it, it's very labor intensive to do so. So it really doesn't happen. The goal is to keep your fruit protected from this pest. The problem is that once the, the, a lot of breakdown occurs once the fruit's been picked, unless it's cooled and consumed really quickly, the fruit breaks down really quickly post harvest, the consumer ends up with poor quality fruit that gets mushy quickly or worse yet, they find larvae inside. Nobody really likes that much. So fresh fruit is definitely a, a really important pathway for introduction um, of this pest into new regions. So spotted wing underwent a really rapid range expansion after 2008. I mentioned it as native to Asia and apparently it was found in Hawaii in 1980, but it wasn't actually causing injury there. But you can see from this, this timeline how widespread this pest became globally in less than 10 years. Um, surveys were also conducted across Canada in 2010, although trapping was pretty limited. The first find in Ontario came late in the year. It was in, in November. It was in a backyard trap. Um, we really weren't sure whether this pest was going to establish in Ontario and be a problem because the information we had at the time suggested it might only be able to survive some years in protected areas with little potential for outbreaks. But unfortunately, that is not the case. This is not only has this pest become established here, we find it across the province, including some fairly northern regions of production, and it can cause some very, very devastating impacts to industry here. It can show up early. It can put crops like June bearing strawberries, raspberries, cherries, and other fruit at risk. And some years are worse than others. In 2017, it was a terrible, terrible year in the Great Lakes region. The pest showed up early, the numbers were high, the pressure was intense, the weather was ideal for spotted wing, and growers really struggled to keep up with the sprays needed to protect their crop through the harvest. So this pest has been a real game changer for fruit production. Um, it's been a, a huge learning experience uh, for everybody. But the reason that it's such a successful pest is that it's an opportunistic insect. It is a landscape level pest. So it has many, many different wild and cultivated hosts, which is something that you've heard about with spotted wing as well, or with uh, lantern fly as well. But this pest also has multiple overlapping generations, and we see it active in Ontario from June to about, well, to late fall. There's a zero threshold for infested fruit. So as soon as you find one spotted wing drosophila in your trapping program, if you have one, and you have ripening fruit, you need to spray to protect it. And you need to keep those sprays up 
all the way through to harvest. So that presents some real challenges for you pick operations, for uh, re-entry, for pre-harvest. There's also seasonal variability in the pest um, activity. So some years are earlier than others. You don't want to spray pesticides needlessly, so you do need to monitor for it. And, and the difference can be anywhere from, you know, uh, a f can be a few weeks different from one year to the next. So regional monitoring is actually really quite important. Um, OMAFRA has been involved in uh, monitoring since 2011. We had some really, really big monitoring programs in those early years with over 100 sites across the province, but that really was not sustainable. We've had a lot of support from consultants and some growers uh, to get the information out, but right now we're kind of at a stage where we're only able to do very limited monitoring, just some key sites, just to give some growers some heads up, and then the monitoring uh, is, is something that they would have to do for on-farm information. One of the things about Spotted Wing is we're all in this together. Um, this theft is parked, at, like it, there's been intense uh, research globally to develop better ways to monitor for it, more sensitive trapping techniques. There's no pheromone for this pest, so the lures are food-based, there's a lot of bycatch. We don't really have a friendly grower, grower trapping system, but there have been efforts to de develop risk models, a search for biocontrols. There's been work on developing these push-pull strategies to keep Spotted Wing out of crops, but for the most part, growers are still really reliable on insecticides to manage the pest because the risk of the crop loss is simply too high and this is one of the reasons why this pest shows up every year on our national min uh, minor use priority setting uh, meetings. Growers have also tried innovative approaches like exclusion netting systems to protect their crop but these can be expensive to set up, they have to be maintained and they come with their own set of problems but if your acreage isn't large they can be effective as long as they're in place before the pest is active and the entry points are eliminated and managed. So living with spotted wing, it's it's really uh, it's it's been a, meant a lot of changes for industry, even just how they grow the crop. Because this pest likes moist, like cool, moist conditions, growers are having to change the canopy shape of their crop. They need to make it much more open so that there's uh, you know, better airflow, better pesticide coverage. They're having to pick a lot more often. You've got to pick clean and often and early. Sanitation is huge. You cannot leave fruit on the ground and you can't leave it uh, hanging on the bush. Pesticide sprays I've mentioned already. Growers, some growers are having to reduce their acreage because of the time required uh, related to sanitation. Um, some of them in some years are gonna have to end their harvest early when pressure is too high and in some cases avoiding the late varieties. And that's a problem because there's been a lot of effort to try to extend the season. And now you have a pest that the pressure is so high late in the season, it makes it hard to grow the crop economically. So, oh, and sorry, just to back on that, we've been living with spotted wing for 10 years now and we're getting better at it, but we're still, we're still struggling, let's put it that way. So the next pest I wanted to talk about is pepper weevil. And this is a pest that's found throughout Central America and the Southern US. It's considered subtropical. It is not thought to be able to survive in our climate, but we have seen it. There have been outbreaks in places like the uh, Northeastern US and New Jersey, for example. And Pew has been found, I'm gonna call it Pew, has been found in BC and in Ontario periodically. But in 2016, there were severe losses in Ontario greenhouse operations, and then these spread to the field later in the season. So this pest arrives with imported peppers from repacking, uh, like for repacking in Ontario facilities, and packing areas have traditionally not been adequately separated from the production houses. So there's no obligate diapause for this pest as long as uh, host plant material is available, it continues to reproduce with multiple overlapping generations. And once it's established, it's, it's really difficult to eradicate it. It completes its entire development protected in the fruit and the infested fruit. It shows injury, but again, it takes time to find a very expensive process to, to have labor looking for in, uh, infested fruit and removing it. The adults are super sneaky, they're excellent at hiding, and they are awesome hitchhikers, unfortunately. So managing this pest requires diligent monitoring and removal and disposal of infested fruit as well as insecticides, which can be very disruptive to the biocontrol programs that are commonly used in greenhouse uh, vegetable production here in Ontario. So there's been a ton of work done on this pest, but a lot of it's been homegrown um, because this is kind of a, a unique situation where we have this uh, pest showing up in greenhouse production facilities in a northern climate. It doesn't survive outside, we don't think. There are cards, like sticky cards and pheromones for monitoring it, but they are suboptimal in terms of their performance. So there's been a lot of work to try to try to improve those. OMAFRA and the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada have assisted with regional monitoring programs to provide early warning of outbreaks, and that's been helpful. 
The problem with the queue is it's a community pest. So the greenhouse operations in Ontario, they are really concentrated. So there's a whole bunch of veg production in southwestern Ontario. And because the pest is super mobile as a hitchhiker and it can, you know, it can move on its own, it spreads rapidly between facilities and to the field. And so that is a that is a huge challenge and it remains so. Um, so the knowledge that's been gained from research has been very helpful for um, managing this pest. Um, there's been some real, real big wins. And in fact, this pep, the pepper weevil has really changed the standard industry practices. So the greenhouse veg growers took the lead in developing standards. They've developed um, better management of imports, so more inspections, better sanitation, separation of packing facilities and production, management of plant, uh, plant waste, a lot more awareness, um, protocols for visitors and move, move, movement of people and equipment. Uh, more growers are using exclusion screens. They're being really creative, like offering bounties on uh, pew found in production facilities for early detection. You see a dog there, well, that's a sniffer dog for pepper weevil, kind of cool. But it, this is really a community uh, community issue for sure. So one of the things with pepper weevil that's, that's really important is that the, the biosecurity programs prepared that were developed for it have really helped prepare the industry as well as OMAFRA for more successfully dealing with other emerging pests. And I think that's that's really, really important. It's, it's, a, it's a good news story in many ways. So the last pest that I wanted to touch on before spotted lantern fly is box tree moth. So this is an excellent example of both citizen science in action and the importance of partnerships for detection and response. So this is native to Asia, this pest. It was introduced to Germany and the Netherlands about 15 years ago, and then it spread through Europe. It feeds on the leaves and bark of, of boxus, and it causes severe damage to native and ornamental species. In August of 2018, a member of the iNaturalist community posted a picture of this insect, and the significance of the find was quickly noted. There was some follow-up inspection by OMAFRA and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to confirm the find, and this was noted as the first in North America. So while we don't have native species of boxwood in Canada, it's planted extensively as an ornamental, and it represents a very important market for the nursery and landscape industries in Ontario. And the thing with box tree moth is the response was absolutely amazing. Like industry, different levels of government, research community all came together to develop these outreach and education programs for 2019 and 2020 to determine the distribution, develop an IPM program to coordinate citizen science and engagement. There were some biopesticides that were obtained to treat infestations on private and public places. <clears throat> and this, um, this was actually funded by industry as well, which is pretty cool. So the distribution was determined through trapping, visual surveys, and engagement of the, of the public. It wouldn't have been possible to obtain this level of information without innovate, like an innovative approach to operations and funding. And of course, moving forward, the CFI is working to industry to figure out the optimal regulatory strategy, and they will be doing more um, uh, surveys nationally to find out if there is, like if this pest is present elsewhere. So at present, there's no production nurseries within the affected area, but this may change over time with this pest. So then we get back to spotted lanternfly as a successful invader, and I think Manny made a pretty good case for that. It has really all the right stuff of being a successful invader. It has a wide host range, an ability to navigate through different habitats, the landscape level pass, it's highly fecund, it has an extended cryptic life stage that can survive unfavorable conditions, it's an excellent hitchhiker capable of being moved over large distances, and it was introduced with at the natural enemy complex that might help keep numbers down. So to me, in many ways, it's very similar to the brown marmorated stink bug, which is another pest that made its way into Canada and indeed globally. I could use this pest as another example. Um, it's well established across southern Ontario and the thing is with it, we still haven't seen the economic injury, which has been reported elsewhere, which is interesting. And, and I, I like, when I think of brown marmorated stink bug in dogs, actually I found the first established population of this pest while I was at walking my dog in a park in Hamilton. Um, and it was, uh, it was a very interesting experience to find it that way. So we hear a lot about grapes. So grapes are a really important uh, fruit crop in Ontario. They are the most valuable fruit in terms of farm gate value. And when you look at the dollars generated through wineries, the supply chain, tours and taxes, the total economic impact is estimated at over $4 billion. So that's pretty significant. While it appears that tree fruit's not as much at risk of injury, um, the, the swarms are there, they're intermittent, they tend to be short duration. There remains a risk to the industry because the presence is annoying from a harvest and you pick the operation standpoint. Plus spotted lantern fly can end up in harvest bins, so it might get transported. And so there's a quarantine aspect to this. And, and direct injury to nursery crops has also been reported. And of course, there's a similar problem associated with presence and detection. 
So for those who aren't familiar, um, Ontario has three areas where commercial grapes are grown, the Niagara region, the Lake Erie North Shore, and Prince Edward County. And these regions have favorable climates for growing grapes. And unfortunately, they have favorable environments for the establishment of spotted lanternfly. There's a lot of the hosts are present in those areas. And of course, you've got lots of transportation corridors running through, right through them. So we worry about introduction for sure. So we know there's a risk to grapes. Um, Mandy mentioned the great work that Heather, Heather Leach and her team at PSU are involved with. They're laid in the vineyard, often in large numbers. They hatch in the spring, they feed on the vines, they can cause a lot of injury. And there's of course movement between the vineyards and nearby wooded areas through the season with a lot of border driven activity. So we see similar features in areas like Niagara where wooded areas uh, with abundant hosts are in close proximity to vineyards. And so it's really likely the information that's being generated from Pennsylvania is also applicable here. And I think that's really important. It's, it's valuable to have that knowledge. So Mandy mentioned the, uh, in, you know, the use of, in, of insecticides and how that's really increased in vineyards. Um, and of course, so that means that the costs are way up. There are different insecticides that have been evaluated by the teams in the US. And although spotted lanternfly are relatively easy to kill, the most effective products that actually have residual activity don't have the most favorable environmental profiles. Most of the products either have been phased out or will be phased out in Canada, and some of them we are not going to see registered here. So this presents a problem not only for management, but also for emergency response efforts should those be required. So studies on the preference for an injury to agricultural landscape hosts are ongoing in affected areas in the U.S. and a lot of the information has a lot of caveats. I know Heather Leach mentions that whenever she's giving a presentation because there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, we do worry about repeated, repeated feeding and as well as environmental stressors and how those might influence the risk as well. But the big industry, um, one, of the, one of the big concerns from a nursery industry standpoint is that there's an increased need for labor associated with inspection compliance, increased pesticide use and loss of markets. And in the US, in Pennsylvania, they've had to adjust their, their even how they load the stock on, like time of day. So load your stock on when there's lower spotted lanternfly activity. They've installed industrial fans at loading docks to sort of push them away from getting into the trucks and things like that. And of course, we've heard about bad press associated with egg masses on Christmas trees. Um, so of course, there's been an effect to that market as well, even though that is not a host. If there's eggs on those trees, people don't want to buy those Christmas trees if they're within an infested area. So we would anticipate similar challenges to Ontario producers should this pest become established. So what is Omatra doing? Um, well, one of the things that we do a lot of is, um, is um, outreach and education. Um, we do produce a lot of information for growers on a regular basis through blogs and social media. There's no newsletters that are going out. We do courses for growers. There's IPM, Integrated Pest Management Scout Training, every year that we do. We feature spotted lanternfly in the programming at the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Convention, which is Ontario, uh, Canada's largest or premier horticulture event. Um, and of course, we're really happy to cross promote um, information that others are doing, like all the, the webinars that have been done through the Invasive Species Center. So that's great. So then we get to detection of this pest. So this is a really large and showy insect. And I feel that this, this is an insect that's going to make its presence known first as a result of citizen science. Over the last few years, we've seen some first of reports coming out of iNaturalist, and these include things like the box tree moth and the European firebug in Ontario, and then the elm zigzag sawfly in Quebec. And a few years ago, we learned about the European cherry fruit fly in Ontario, another first for North America and one of quarantine concern from the picture submitted by someone documenting the diversity in a park in Mississauga. So citizen science like this, um, these platforms like iNaturalist and others are incredibly important and we need to we need to tap into them for sure. So last year, there was a false alarm for lanternfly in Ontario when a user posted a picture of nits to the What's This Bug subreddit. The title of the post was What Weird Bug Found in Mississauga. This response from the community was swift. The respondents were like quick to identify the past and direct them to contact CFIA. And it turned out the, the picture was actually taken in New Jersey, not in Ontario. But how everything unfolded shows how important social media and citizen science can be when it comes to early detection of invasives. It was really interesting to read through the post. And one of the quotes that stood out for me was, a false alarm is momentarily anxiety inducing, but missing a real one would be keel over and die from a heart attack, scary. And I think that's accurate. 
So obviously this pest has been our, on our radar for several years now. We do have limited resources in terms of monitoring, but we have conducted some surveys at high risk locations in 2016 and 2018, focusing on tree banding and visual surveys of Tree of Heaven. And we've recently received funding from the Ontario Grape and Wine Research Incorporated to do some surveys and risk assessment this year. There is no dedicated funding at the provincial level to support surveillance program for plant health. A lot of the work is done ad hoc, uh, ad hoc with partners like universities or Agriculture Canada, um, using existing resources typically involving staff and, and summer students but we've had some successes. There's been dozens of papers published over the last five or six years, and they've all contributed to the knowledge base of these on the, of spotted lanternfly. Um, they focused on developing, you know, what's the biology, the impact, the pathways, capacity for spread, techniques to improve monitoring and surveillance, and we really need that information here. Northeastern IPM, fund, funded by the USDA and supported by academic institutions, they've set up a website where people can go to, for up-to-date information. And we've participated, OMAFRA staff have participated in those working groups for other pests like spotted and drosophila or ground armored and stink bugs. So it really helps to have that perspective before the, the arrival of a pest. We benefit from being able to participate across borders. So obviously um, the invasive species our outreach committee has been very important um, in terms of uh, you know planning, how do we, you know, what's what's going on and, and how do we get the information out to people? It's been fantastic. Thank you, Mandy, et cetera. This pest is now listed as a regulated pest in Canada and CFIA is working on some risk mitigation strategies to address introduction. There's also talk of developing a spotted lanternfly technical advisory committee to address things like surveillance and risk and outreach and planning. There's been lots of efforts to identify biocontrols in the US um, so that they go to the point of origin in China, they look for natural enemies there and they screen them. And there's actually, I, I found it, there's ongoing work in Canada as well. We've been working with Cabby in Switzerland to proactively identify and screen candidates. The, the project's actually funded by Ag Canada. So doing this, this screening before a pest arrives, natural enemies can be released at an earlier date. Um, this earlier stage of the management process. So both egg and nymphal parasitoids have been identified um, as potential bios, which is cool. So I'm just gonna finish off here um, with this addressing spotted lanternfly. I participated in a really cool um, summit, uh, two-day summit at the 2018 Entomological Society of America joint with Canada uh, meeting in Vancouver, where we talked about the global challenge of invasive species. And what came out of that, not surprisingly, was how important it is to have international uh, collaboration in addressing these pests. We cannot do these things alone. We also need to plan better um, our prevention and response plans by having plans in place and defined roles. We need to be really innovative in terms of uh, you know, how we detect things, how we manage them. Um, so for example, um, environmental, uh, looking for um, molecular, molecular traits, Sorry, I'm losing my voice. But like eDNA uh, monitoring in environmental stuff is really important. Um, and, and really the importance of people. So engaging citizen science to broaden the base, getting that public buy-in is absolutely huge. So each pest situation is unique, requires different responses, but much of the process and roles, they remain the same. Partnerships, communication, research, surveys, reporting systems are all critically, like they're all critical to um, preventing and managing new plant health risks. And with that, I will end my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah, that was great. Um, definitely learned a lot, so thank you. I'm just going to share my webcam here. Right. Well, um, get into the audience's questions. So if you haven't um, already done so, feel free to put any questions into the question box. And I'm just gonna pull it up here. So my first question um, looks to be for um, Hannah. During fruit harvest and washing, is there the ability to use eDNA models for detection similar to detect detection research of brown marmorated stink bug in farm fields that can be applied to the spotted fruit fly? 
Oh, you asked about eDNA for brand marmorated? Yeah, I, I, I'm not clear on the question, I'm sorry. Is there the ability to use e, um, environmental DNA models uh, for detection similar to, I guess, the spotted fruit fly that, you know, it's been used for the brown marmorated stink bug and is there the ability to use that for the fruit fly? Okay, um, I think I'll just go to the question of using eDNA. So actually there was just a paper that came out on using eDNA for detecting spotted lanternfly in the environment. Um, it, and um, it, uh, it, it does, it suggests that uh, in addition to um, like monitoring for early detection, it, it actually adds a layer. Like you can, you can find uh, clues that this pest has been present um, via eDNA at the early stages of an invasion. So it's considered to be a, a, a useful tool for detection. I'm not sure if I answered that question appropriately, but that's that's sort of what I got out of that. I'm not aware of eDNA uh, efforts with brown marmorated. They probably occur. <laughs> they probably somebody has done that, um, but I I haven't read I haven't read that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see too many questions in here, but I do have a few. Um, I have a question from Mandy. And I was just hoping you could talk about the difference in the egg mass between a gypsy moth and the spotted lanternfly. Sure. Um, so spotted lanternfly, as I mentioned, it's got that putty-like material. It's very gray, um, kind of smooth at first, and then gets cracked over time. While gypsy moth are orange, they tend to be kind of vibrant orange actually, not in every case. Sometimes they're a little more on the gray side, but they have this orange tinge to them and they're fuzzy. Uh, and so that's something that's definitely not the case for spotted lanternfly, very smooth surface or cracked, while the gypsy moth will be a little bit fuzzier. They're the same size and similar to shapes, uh, but the coloring and the fuzziness is gonna be what designates the two. Okay, great, thanks Mandy. Um, and then I guess my final question, which is for the both of you, um, a little bit different um, depending on who I'm asking, um, but with, I'll start with Mandy. What is your, what is the major concern with um, the spotted lanternfly for here in Ontario, do you think? Well, I mean, just to the fact that this is such a prolific invader, it does really, really well. It's doing really well in the North American populations and, and we don't want it in any aspect of our lives or any industry. Um, but I, I think, you know, wine is a, is a good one to mention because it's the one that tends to be pretty hard, uh, hard hit. That industry gets really, really hard hit. And um, I think that the awareness needs to uh, get out there a little bit more to the wine industries. I think that we need to reach out uh, more there. Um, and uh and and collaborate a little because i i you know if it gets into our wine industry that's you know billions of dollars uh that that could be impacted as a result and uh people love wine <laughs> you know it's definitely something that they care about when you hear that your wine might be a a problem or impacted in any way or cost more money to you because of uh increased uh, insecticide applications that's going to be something that uh bothers consumers for sure and i think that the connection of spotted lanternfly and wine to that large uh, uh, group of consumers is a good one, right? It, it's gonna get people to be mo more aware. Yes, I completely agree with you, Mandy. Uh, thank you. And Hannah, for you, I'm just wondering, out of all the species you mentioned during your presentation, which is the most concerned for you and why? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question because I know with um, there were some headlines that came out of the states when lanternfly was identified, like worst pest ever, and I've heard that a lot. I mean, it, I guess it depends on perspective. I mean, certainly pests that um, can uh, that kill kill the host, like tree killing species, are of, of huge importance. Um, from an agricultural standpoint, even though you know I talk about spotted wing Drosophila and the fact that you know we've been it's been here for a long time, we're dealing with it. It costs growers money in many different commodities globally. It causes a lot of issues. So cumulatively, it's problematic. It's never going to go away. The, the way that people managing it is primarily by using insecticides. So it's a problem past. Um, 
but I mean, it depends on the context, like brown marmorated stink bug, which I didn't talk about. And I kind of, I wish I did because it's so similar in many ways to spotted lantern fly. Um, it, it can have terrible outbreak years in some jurisdictions where it causes a, a lot of injury to, uh, it attacks the uh, fruiting structures. Um, they all present challenges, right? And they all require different responses, but they're similar in many ways. It's that whole, these are such big issues. We need a lot of people. We need a lot of people thinking about them, talking about them, spreading the word about them in order to manage them effectively. Yeah, I think it's really hard too because invasive species in general are just very unpredictable and you don't know how they're they're going to act and every year is different. So um, yeah. that's definitely a challenge. Yeah. I mean, it, it is the, the nice thing with the nice thing if there is one with spotted lanternfly as much as with brown marmorated stink bug, we had a bit of a warning that this pest was coming, right? And that's that's important for preparedness because we learn and we share our information. I mean, working groups, those international working groups and collaborations are, are so important. Um, we, we have an opportunity here with this particular pest to prepare for it. I mean, I think it's naive to think it won't arrive, um, but it's, uh, it's what we do um, to prepare for it um, ahead of time that, really will define how big of an issue it is when we first find it. Yes, I, I definitely agree. And I also think too, I, I'm not sure if, you know, the results of COVID um, maybe slowed down the spread of the spotted lantern fly, maybe it's risk from entering um, into Canada. So um, that could be a potential as well. Um, but it's two minutes after 12 and I don't see any more questions in the question box. So I'm going to end it there. So I just want to thank you, Hannah and Mandy again for presenting today and for everyone for, uh, tuning in. Um, the next session is titled Invading Ontario Waters, Part 1, Asian Carps and their, great, and their Threat to the Great Lakes. And this starts at 1 p.m. So I hope to see you there and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Anna. Bye.